One thing they like to refer to as proof for India's secularism is the preamble to the Constitution, which today says India is a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic, which they think is dateline to 26 November 1949, when the Constitution was declared. Now, in fact, the words socialist, secular were only inserted under the emergency in the 70s by Indira Gandhi. They were instituted without parliamentary debate. They are the least democratic part of the Constitution. It is said that Bhim Rao Ramji Ambedkar, who chaired the uh, Constituent Assembly, uh, or at least the Constitution Committee within it, had rejected the term secular. At any rate, he did not include it. More about Article 25. Nothing in this article shall affect the operation of any existing law or prevent the state from making any law providing for social welfare and reform or the throwing open of Hindu religious institutions of a public character to all classes and sections of Hindus. Now, you see, among Muslims, there are certainly also equalities, especially between men and women. And the state does not claim the right to do anything whatsoever to Islamic institutions so that they can enforce the equality of women. So the state is interfering, is very explicitly claiming for itself the right to interfere in Hindu life and not in that of the minority. This article is a dead letter. So far, no government has gotten serious about a uniform civil code. At one point in the 90s, the Supreme Court has asked the government and a Congress government, what have you done so far to move towards a, uh, a uniform civil code? There was no answer, and we know that no government has done anything about this, including the BJP government. Today, with elections on the horizon, we hear voices in the BJP, yeah, we should make this an election issue, and after the elections, we should institute a common civil code. Uh, I don't know how serious they are about it. I know that they're going to provoke a storm from the Muslim side who absolutely don't want this. They regard separate Muslim law as a part of Islam. So they want to have uh, Muslim law for inheritance, for marriage, uh, for the status of children vis-a-vis -vis their parents and so on. And um, if you touch that, you know, you're going to arouse a lot of opposition. And maybe sometimes that is necessary, but I think in this case that the BJP is not at all ready to do this. Now, I may be mistaken, I, you know, I'm curious, but you see, when I see that the BJP doesn't dare to go ahead with the CAA, the uh, Citizenship Amendment Act, which they had passed through Parliament, but so they're afraid of implementing it. They're postponing and postponing and postponing the implementation. And that's a very, very toothless little law that has no effect at all on Indian Muslims. Now here, common civil code is going to affect them very deeply, and all of them. So that's going to arouse a lot of people. You have the duty to develop the scientific temper, humanism, and the spirit of inquiry and reform. Now that was Nehru's subtle way of attacking Hinduism, of saying, you see, this is obscurantism. Fortunately, the light of reason will blow it away. In fact, I think that Hinduism, minus a bit of dead wood that indeed won't survive, uh, but basically it is far more in harmony with the scientific temper than the basis of Christianity and Islam, who are built on certain dogmas that are quite irrational. 
and that won't survive the scientific temper. Before the law, a truly secular state would have no Hindus, no Muslims, no Parsis, no Christians, only Sikhs. So that's what um, I think India should do if it wants to become a secular state, abolish all these religious distinctions in the letter of the law. Today we're going to focus on the question, is India a secular state? So the usual story you will find in practically all articles and scientific papers and books about the religious question in India is India is a secular state. All religions are equal before the Indian law. Mahatma Gandhi believed in secularism. Jawaharlal Nehru, as the first prime minister, made secularism into law. He put secularism in the constitution. So that's, that's what all of them say. Or they imply this by saying, the BJP is a threat to secularism in India. They all display their ignorance. One thing they like to refer to as proof for India's secularism is the preamble to the Constitution, which today says India is a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic, which they think is dateline to 26 November 1949 when the Constitution was declared. Now, in fact, the words socialist, secular, were only inserted under the emergency in the 70s by Indira Gandhi. They were instituted without parliamentary debate. They are the least democratic part of the Constitution. It is said that Bhim Rao Ramji Ambedkar, who chaired the uh, Constituent Assembly, uh, or at least the Constitution Committee within it, had rejected the term secular. At any rate, he did not include it. So let's see what the Constitution says. Article 15. The state shall not discriminate against any citizen on grounds only of religion, race, caste, sex, place of birth, or any of them. That seems secular enough. Then another part of this article says, nothing in this article or in a subclause of Article 90, which between brackets uh, stipulates freedom of expression and freedom of association. So nothing of freedom of expression or freedom of association can prevent the state from making any special provision by law for the advancement of any socially and educationally backward classes of citizens or for the scheduled tribes or scheduled uh, castes uh, in so far as such special provisions relate to their admission to educational institutions, including private educational institutions, whether aided or unaided by the state, other than the minority educational institutions refer to in Article 30. We'll come to Article 30 later on. But so already this clearly stipulates that there is one rule for minority educational institutions and one for the majority. These are, in fact, all articles uh, from 12 to 35 are classed as fundamental rights. That means you can go to court uh, if you think that they're not being followed, to demand that they're being implemented. This uh, in contradistinction with the directive principles, a part of the Constitution 
has some as a wish list of things to do, but they cannot be enforced. So these can be enforced. Article 25. Subject to public order, morality, and health, and to the other provisions of this part, all persons are equally entitled to freedom of conscience and the right freely to profess, practice, and propagate religion. Religious propagate was included, nobody asked for it, but it was included under pressure from the Christian missionaries. Now, um, I have known a Jesuit, he's long dead now, but he told me that you know, this was a normal thing that once in a while they bribed Indian politicians for the benefit of their mission. So uh, this presupposes the Christian definition of religion where it is adherence to a certain doctrine and where you con can convince others of this doctrine and thus convert them. This doesn't exist in Hinduism or in Zoroastrianism. In, in, in Hinduism, you normally don't convert. Maybe in, on occasion of a mixed uh, marriage, um, with you know modern Westerners who don't care about religion. If they marry a Hindu, they will convert to Hinduism just pro forma. They don't think it implies anything. Um, and I don't know if, if Hindus see it as a conversion either. Uh, at any rate, among Parsis, it's a bit fiercer. There, in case of a mixed marriage, the Parsi has to join the religion of the other party. So you can never have Muslims or Hindus or, or whoever joining the Parsi religion. Parsis are biologically pure. They're all Parsi by birth. But so that means that this right to propagate has no meaning for them. So this is a specifically Christian and by extension Muslim uh, concern in the constitution. More about Article 25. Nothing in this article shall affect the operation of any existing law or prevent the state from making any law providing for social welfare and reform or the throwing open of Hindu religious institutions of a public character to all classes and sections of Hindus. Now, you see, among Muslims, there are certainly also equalities, especially between men and women. And the state does not claim the right to do anything whatsoever to Islamic institutions so that they can enforce the equality of women. So the state is interfering, is very explicitly claiming for itself the right to interfere in Hindu life and not in that of the minorities. Incidentally, it also says the wearing and carrying of kirpans, uh, daggers, shall be deemed to be included in the profession of the Sikh religion. Sikhs are allowed to carry that. And in the Anglosphere, among the British police and so on, this has already been the rule for a long time. OK, so more about Article 25. Uh, the reference to Hindus shall be construed as including a reference to persons professing the Sikh, Jain, or Buddhist religion. And the reference to Hindu religious institutions shall be construed accordingly. So this follows the definition introduced by the first Muslim invaders. A Hindu is any Indian who is not a Muslim or Christian. Now, the secularist view is that this amounts to uh, Brahmin assimilative communalism. They try to incorporate Buddhism and Jainism and Sikhi into the Hindu religion. You see, that which the British and the constitution makers deemed obvious, this they try to criminalize. They try to see some wily Brahmin conspiracy behind it. But so Dr. Ambedkar 
clearly uh, saw and, and explained that the Buddhists or the Jains or the Sikhs had never had a separate system of law. They followed the existing Hindu law. And so it's only correct that the, that the Constitution continues to do this. Article 26. Subject to public order, morality, and health, every religious denomination or any section thereof shall have the right to establish and maintain institutions for religious and charitable purposes to manage its own affairs in matters of religion. They have a freedom of conscience and free profession practice and propagation of religion, freedom to manage religious affairs. So what you have here is something like the American version of secularism. You see, in the West, you have essentially two versions of secularism, the French version, where the state is protected against religion. You see, this refers to the situation of the Catholic religion at the time in the, the 18th century. <coughs> where the state felt the need to protect itself against religion. Whereas you also have the American version, which uh, stems from the situation of the colonizers from Britain. In Britain, the minorities, that is to say everyone except the Church of England, uh, was oppressed or at least was treated as second-class citizens. Like for example, to uh, get entry to the University of Oxford, you had to be an Anglican. So uh, when they went to America, they didn't want that anymore. So you get a number of states founded by, uh, by conglomerates of the different Protestant sects or of the Catholics who were also a minority in Britain. They got the state of Maryland named after Mary, who is venerated by Catholics. Or you see the Puritans went to Massachusetts, or the Quakers went to Pennsylvania. And so every state was entitled to have a state religion, but the union uh, that brought together these states and that became the United States was not allowed to have a state religion. So the state could not oppress any of the religions, it had to be religiously neutral. And so that principle is also brought in this uh, Article 26, save for the fact that perhaps many people don't notice that here also you have the notion of propagation, which is a Christian notion foreign to Hinduism or Zoroastrianism. Article 27. No person shall be compelled to pay any taxes, the proceeds of which are specifically appropriated in payment of expenses for the promotion or maintenance of every particular religion or religious denomination. This is not really followed. Um, some religious purposes mingle with the promotion of tourism or uh, the upkeep of heritage or the safety of sites and pilgrims. Secondly, more unsecularly, is that Hindu temples are taken over by the state, their proceeds are appropriated by the state and used for non-religious purposes or even in the service of other religions. And that happens only to Hindu temples that can't happen by law with the places of worship of the minorities. Uh, the state used to pay, I don't think it's still the case, the state used to pay subsidies for the Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca, which doesn't even exist in Islamic states. And indeed it is contrary to the principle itself of pilgrimage, which is a kind of sacrifice you sacrifice your own time and your own means to pay for your own pilgrimage. And so the idea of letting your pilgrimage be paid by someone else is actually contrary to the principle of pilgrimage. Article 28, no religious instruction shall be provided in any educational institution, wholly maintained out of state funds, 
no person attending any educational institution recognized by the state or receiving aid out of state funds shall be required to take part in any religious instruction that may impart it, be imparted in such institution or to attend any religious worship that may be conducted in such institution. You see, this is an element of the French type of secularism protection against religion, where religion is seen as a threat that should not contaminate you. Article 29. Any section of the citizens engaged, uh, residing in the territory of India, uh, having a distinct language, script, or culture of its own, shall have the right to conserve the same. This actually is, is not strict, for India at least, not strictly a modern idea. Since ancient uh, India, you have this Hindu idea of non-violence, not in the extremist, impractical sense preached by Mahatma Gandhi, but in this deeper sense that everything which exists has a right to exist and should be allowed to continue existing. Um, so all the sects, uh, or all the languages and so on, have a right to preserve themselves. Then in Article 29, it is also said, no citizen shall be denied admission into any educational institution maintained by the state or receiving aid out of state funds on grounds only of religion, race, caste, language, or any of them. Now, who could object to that? Of course, we don't want this discrimination. And yet, here we get Article 30, which is the most discriminatory of all. All minorities, whether based on religion or language, shall have the right to establish and administer educational institutions of their choice. The state shall not, in granting aid to educational institutions, discriminate against any educational institution on the ground that it is under the management of minority, whether based on religion or language. Now, this extends right to the minorities. It, strictly speaking, says nothing about the majority. And I don't think that the fathers of the Constitution in the late 1940s had any intention of discriminating against the Hindus, of withholding the rights from Hindus that they were extending to minorities. However, since Indira Gandhi, this has become the standard interpretation. It's a crass discrimination against uh, Hinduism. And so that's also where the start lies of the scramble for the exit. A number of uh, Hindu sects that invest in education fear that their schools will be taken over by the state and therefore have gone to court to demand recognition as a non-Hindu minority. You see, the rats are leaving the sinking ship. Hinduism, because of these constitutional articles, is a sinking ship, is discriminated against. If you want to escape that discrimination, either you can amend the constitution or at the very least, the interpretation of the Constitution. Or you can send all the other Hindus to hell and save yourself by having yourself declared non-Hindu. So this way, the Ramakrishna mission, for example, has tried, although failed, to be recognized as non-Hindu and thus get minority privileges. An application of this seems to be the Right to Education Act of 2008 under a combined Congress communist uh, rule. This discriminates concretely against Hindu schools. You see, it forces schools to take in 25% of non-paying pupils. But this only applies to Hindu schools for a reason we shall see. And as a consequence, 
it's only Hindu schools that bear this burden, and hundreds of Hindu schools have had to close down. Others are deeply in debt. So this cannot affect the minority schools. Now, some people, especially in the BJP, say, ah, oh, this is a discrimination imposed by Congress. Oh, we want a Congress Mukt Bharat, uh, an India free from Congress. Now, this has really nothing to do with Congress. You see, the Right of Education Act simply lays down that there is this burden for schools, these 25% non-paying pupils. It is then, after this was instituted, that the court ruled, ah, but this doesn't count for minority schools. So minority schools are free from this burden, only Hindu schools bear it. Not because of anything Congress did, but because of something that the Constitution says. It is the Constitution that is anti-secular. You have a similar inequality, but which is very diversified, very complex. I, not my job here to explain it all. But it is regarding the management of places of worship. So unlike mosques or churches, many temples are being taken over by the state. This is especially in order to siphon off their income. Now, Article 44, which is not a fundamental right, but a directive principle, which can't be enforced, says, the state shall endeavor to secure for the citizens a uniform civil code throughout the territory of India. Well, this article is a dead letter. So far, no government has gotten serious about a uniform civil code. At one point in the 90s, the Supreme Court has asked the government and a Congress government, what have you done so far to move towards a, a uniform civil code? There was no answer. And we know that no government has done anything about this, including the BJP government. Today, with elections on the horizon, we hear voices in the BJP, yeah, we should make this an election issue, and after the elections, we should institute a common civil code. Uh, I don't know how serious they are about it. I know that they're going to provoke a storm from the Muslim side who absolutely don't want this. They regard separate Muslim law as a part of Islam. So they want to have uh, Muslim law for inheritance, for marriage, uh, for the status of children vis-a-vis -vis their parents and so on. And um, if you touch that, you know, you're going to arouse a lot of opposition. And maybe sometimes that is necessary but I think in this case that the BJP is not at all ready to do this. Now, I may be mistaken. I, you know, I'm curious. But you see, when I see that the BJP doesn't dare to go ahead with the CAA, the uh, Citizenship Amendment Act, which they had passed through Parliament, but so they're afraid of implementing it. They're postponing and postponing and postponing the implementation. And that's a very, very toothless little law that has no effect at all on Indian Muslims. Now here, common civil code is going to affect them very deeply and all of them. So that's going to arouse a lot of opposition. So I think that the uniform civil code is not really a Hindu concern. It is a secular concern. You see, Hindu states in the past did not have a uniform civil code. You see, by caste, by community, different systems prevailed for different communities. And this is a modern demand. Now, of course, Hindus are used to it. And so now, you see, they, they, they can identify with the idea of a common civil code. But actually, those who should really demand the common civil code are the secularists. It is a secular par excellence. In Belgium, it's unthinkable to have different law systems for people of different religions. 
So this is a defining trait of secular states that all citizens, regardless of religion, are equal before the law. So if, if you have a, a secularist friend, you see, ask him what he has now already done for a common civil code. He's not much of a secularist if he's not working for a common civil code. Mm -hmm. So the effective secularist code is separate law codes for Hindus, Muslims, Christians, and Parsis are secular. You see, if you want to know what the difference is between real secularism and Indian secularism, this phrase more or less sums it up. So this arch non-secular principle of separate law codes, that is what here they call secular. Those who oppose uh, separate law codes, they are communalists. So elsewhere you would say that the opposite is the case. In Arab countries, they abhor the notion of secular, which is totally at variance with Islam. In India, every Muslim fundamentalist calls himself a secularist. Why? Because in India, secular does not mean secular. Secular means anti-Hindu. Then there's Article 51 about fundamental duties. There's only one such article. It shall be the duty of every citizen of India to abide by the Constitution and respect its ideals and institutions, the national flag, and the national anthem. Now here I remark, anthems are rejected by many Muslims, in general already, because anthems are deemed idolatrous. Um, so the same thing counts you know, for anthems and for flags for very marginal sects of Christianity, like the Jehovah Witnesses. They don't like, you know, greeting the flag or, you know, singing the national anthem and so on. They also consider that idolatrous. So in Islam, it is a pretty general view. Um, and so uh, Vande Mataram was unacceptable to them as anthem because it was worship of Goddess Durga. And even the present anthem, Janagana Mana, is actually a crypto worship of Krishna, of Durga, and of Shiva. You know, you read the third, fourth, fifth stanza, they leave you in no doubt that the, uh, the Janagana Mana Adhinayak, the, the commander of the people's mind, and the Bharata Bhagya Vidhata, the uh, dispenser of India's destiny, that he is the charioteer who yuge yuge in every age, as the Bhagavad Gita says. Because he comes back to uphold dharma, you know, that's Krishna. And who, whose role in the Mahabharata is as the charioteer of uh, Arjuna. And so you have similar lines for Goddess Durga, the combative mother, and for Shiva, the eternal guru. So even this anthem seemingly secular, is in fact also what in Islamic terms is called idolatrous. Then there is another fundamental duty, is to uphold and protect the sovereignty, unity, and integrity of India. So the partition already, 